The topic for discussion tonight is video art, which Ross has authority on. In 1971, he became the first curator of video art at the University Museum in Syracuse, New York. He was very young, and so was video art, so he has the history. But he is also somebody who has kept shaping the ongoing conversation about video art in general. So it is great to have him here to talk to us tonight. Thank you very much, Haftor. Thank you very much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be here in, in Iceland. It's a place I've wanted to come for a long time. And, uh, and I am very grateful to the museum and to, and to the embassy and to all those who were part of uh, the invitation for me to come and speak with you this evening. Uh, I am going to talk about video in, in some ways tonight, uh, and, but it became clear to me that as I was meeting people here in the last two days, that I, that I needed to put it into a, into a different kind of context slightly, but uh, and perhaps a little bit more <coughs> autobiographical and a little bit more historical than I intended. But uh, yes, I did begin my museum career uh, as um, what turned out to be the world's first curator of video art at a time when most people didn't know or care what video art was, which was very good, it was very useful to be uh, in a place where nobody's paying attention <clears throat> and where you can make all the mistakes you want and uh, where you can uh, feel free to invent. Uh, and uh, that happened through a number of of remarkable accidents, because I never intended to work in the art world, in the field of fine arts, never remotely intended or even imagined working in an art museum <coughs> um, and, until the day I started working in one, which made me kind of different and a bit of an outsider and someone uh, that m many of my colleagues over the years found it difficult to relate to or trust. Um, Enough of them liked me, but that didn't really mean that much. But they, they couldn't understand why I was doing what I was doing because in some real way, I don't think I really understood why I was doing what I was doing. Uh, I, um, when I was still in my senior year as an undergraduate at, at Syracuse University, I, my uh, degree was, had nothing to do with art. I was in political science and journalism. And my fantasy future was to be writing editorials for the New York Times or something like that. That was sort of what I'd thought about. Uh, I was very involved in, um, in the anti-war movement. I was a long-haired hippie guy with a little kind of beard and a kind of Jufro haircut. And uh, very much like many of my friends, mostly involved with finding ways to um, act outrageously on behalf of the anti-war movement and to try to make our voice heard as a generation, and that really consumed in the late 60s an enormous amount of our time. That plus a little rock and roll, sex, drugs, rock and roll in some order, uh, was how I would define my interests at that point in, relation, in addition to my concern about uh, the war. Uh, the war was really an abiding thing for Americans at that point, and especially if you were of draft age, which I was, uh, you had to think, what would I do if I was drafted and had to go fight a war I didn't believe in? <clears throat> and um, what can I do to make this war stop as an as essentially powerless young person? And, and so we were part of a generation, none of us felt very, in, in, individually heroic at all, but we were part of a generation who felt we had a responsibility to not just witness, but to take part in, in social action that would have some impact on the world and on, and on ourselves in a kind of self-interested way. I surely didn't want to go fight in a jungle uh, against people I had no need to fight. Uh, and so that was my mindset. <clears throat> uh, and, um, you know, until the summer of 1969, uh, I was making photographs and writing and thinking that this was an interesting path and I was doing what I wanted to do. I went to Woodstock that summer, which was not as good as history makes it sound like. It was, <laughs> it was extremely uncomfortable. Uh, uh, you know, rainy and hot. Jimi Hendrix playing at 
at sunrise was interesting and memorable. But uh, most of it was, was really kind of awful and crowded and muddy and sweaty and filled with people trying to sell you a glass of water for five dollars. So the, the whole hippie thing was a little overstated. But uh, what I did see there was, the, for, for the first time, was a portable video camera, which Sony had just introduced recent, uh, relatively recently to that date, and was uh, an unbelievable thing. I mean, today, you know, since we all have, uh, you know, cameras in our pocket, and we all have video cameras with us all the time, it, it, it's hard to imagine that that was in any way an event to see a portable video camera and a portable video recorder. They weighed about 40 pounds and you carried it over your shoulder and probably did long-term damage to your back and spine. Yes, Gunnar, I'm talking to you, thank you. Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter was that, that it, it was an amazing thing because prior to uh, that invention, the idea of producing television, of involving yourself in that world of television meant you were a part of a corporation. Only corporations could afford uh, television cameras, uh, television studios, television equipment was extremely, extremely expensive. A camera was maybe a quarter of a million dollars. Videotape had only been invented in 1957, so the whole idea of video was only, was just a little over a decade old, and now here all of a sudden was a, a device that was as radical as uh, the 35 millimeter camera was to uh, making photography in the field. And as a photographer, I was immediately fascinated by it. And so I, uh, I recall going back to school the next year and going to my faculty advisor and saying, you know, all bets are off. I'm not interested in, in newspaper work anymore. I'm not interested in photography in, in this way anymore. This, this new device I saw is going to change journalism. It's going to change so many things. I have no idea, but I, I want to do this. This is what I want to do, portable video. And uh, this uh, kind of crusty uh, old kind of semi-retired journalist said to me, well, Mr. Ross, you know, this is a professional school and we do not play in this school with toys. We don't play with toys. If you want to play with toys, I suggest you go across the street to the art school because that's what they do in art school. They play with toys. You know, and he made a kind of a crude gesture that I won't repeat here. And, uh, and I thought, hmm. I don't think I'm going to take this. And so I said, thank you very much. And I walked out and went across the street and walked into the art school and found the first professor I could find. And I said, you know, that I was a senior and I was across the street at the journalism school, but I wasn't interested in that. I wanted to work in video. And the guy said, well, we don't know what that is, but sure. And I said, oh, I think I found myself at home. This is interesting. And, uh, and so the, immediately they went out and bought video equipment, and uh, I was able to very quickly start playing with this new tool. And, uh, and it was an amazing thing to explore because uh, as, <clears throat> let's say that I'm not a very patient man, uh, a Polaroid f picture took too long for me. You know, waiting a full 60 seconds to see a photograph was, so video also was, you know, the kind, of, the kind of thing that my attention deficit disorder personality was meant for. It's like immediate, and I just love this idea, being able to just be out, make a picture, look at it immediately, what would you do with it? There was nowhere to show it. You could show it back on a little teeny monitor or whatever, but still, it was an amazing thing. So I, my, my goal was to do that. And, uh, and to learn how to do that. And in fact, over the next several months, uh, I started working every day there. I didn't want to do anything else. Made a great new friend who was a year younger than me and who was a musician like uh, I was, but he was even more serious. Uh, and his name was Bill Viola. And, um, and Bill and I just started working together in this, with this little crappy equipment that the school bought for us, but it was fantastic. Uh, and in fact, we are having so much fun that this faculty in this department said, why don't you come and become a graduate student here next year and you can teach undergraduates how to use this video stuff because you know, all you need to do is be a couple of weeks ahead of the students anyway. There's a secret he was revealing to me about, about art education, which I've, I've managed to maintain all these years. And so I thought, well, that's a good idea because I could use some more time uh, to do this. <clears throat> and so I, everything was going really well, I, except about a month later, I got called into the deans of the art school's office, and I'd never met him before because it really wasn't my school. 
And he said, Mr. Ross, please come and have a seat. This is very embarrassing, and uh, I, I just want to get this over with. But you can be a graduate student, but you can't be a teaching fellow. We're sorry. And I thought to myself, well, they figured out I don't have any talent. I'm not actually an artist, so I guess I could live with that. And I said, thank you, and I left and went back to the studio. And the faculty there erupted, like, they can't say this. The dean has no power to say this. We, we want you to be artist. And uh, uh, the faculty politics, right? School, art schools. And so I said, look, I, I don't really care. It's okay, don't worry about it. And he said, no, I'm gonna to get to the bottom of it. And he walks over to the dean's office, the dean's out. He goes to the dean's filing cabinet and finds a file with my name on it, pulls it out. Brings it back over to the studio, we open it up, and in there is a letter from some right-wing faculty member in the journalism school uh, to the dean saying, we hear that you've offered Mr. Ross a, a teaching fellowship. We want to tell you that we think he's a communist. <laughs> Uh, you know, one of these anti-war agitators, and if you have him in your program as a graduate student, he's just going to cause trouble. And now I'm uh, angry, really angry, and so I think, what, what am I going to do? Uh, so I quickly went to the chancellor at the university, who I'd known, and, uh, because I was, you know, a, an, an editor of the student newspaper. I was, you know, a good, a good kid. I was not a, really a troublemaker. Uh, even though there were photos of me that looked suspicious in various anti-war rallies, I was really just like everyone else, just an earnest undergraduate. <clears throat> and so I said to the chancellor, you know, this is not something you should be proud of, to have faculty blackballing a student for their political beliefs. And he looked at me and looked at the file and he said, thank you very much for bringing this to my attention. And I left thinking, okay, I've taken care of this. And of course, the faculty member who took the file for me was suspended for breaking confidentiality, faculty, whatever. You weren't supposed to do that, apparently, as a faculty member, like show the cards. So this is my mindset. <clears throat> On the day that I get a call to the city's museum, it actually wasn't the university museum, it was the city's museum, the Everson Museum, a call from a friend to come and take a photograph of their new director. And they would give me $100 for this photograph, which is one of the ways I was supporting myself. And I said, fine, I'll go to an art museum, I'll take a picture of this museum director, I could care less, but $100 in those days was a month's rent, or four ounces of really pretty decent student grade pot, and one way or the other. Uh, and I thought that was a decent fee for a photograph. And I showed up to take a photograph of this guy, his name was James Harithus, an amazing guy, but I had no idea who he was. I'd never been in that museum before, quite frankly. It was a brand new IMP art museum. I walk into his office and there's this guy sitting in a business suit, signing letters, short hair, you know, he was clearly over 30, so like, you know, why, what was I gonna talk to this guy about? And I'm shuffling from foot to foot with my little Nikon and my tie-dye t-shirt, actually, <clears throat> and uh, waiting for him to acknowledge my presence. And he wouldn't even look up from his signing papers, whatever he was doing, this was like the last straw. You know, I just had it with old people at that point. And so I, I remembered something that I'd heard in a photography class that when Joseph Karsh had to take a photograph of Churchill and couldn't get Churchill to, uh, to pay attention or to emote, he walked over to Churchill and snatched, snapped this, uh, snatched the cigar out of his hands. And then Churchill made this scowl, which he then photographed, and it's a very famous photograph that some people think won the Second World War. It was like that powerful. Now, Harithus wasn't smoking a cigar, um, but so there was no way I could do something that obvious, but I did just, you know, screw my courage up, and I said, listen, buddy, this museum you've taken over here, it's total bullshit. And if it, you know, it's got a one zip code membership, and if it doesn't become a television station in the next decade, it's gonna be obsolete. So I figured he would like get angry and I would get a good emotional photograph and then I'd leave and get my hundred dollars. But instead he kind of looked up over his glasses at me and he said, oh, well, if you're so damn smart, why don't you be my assistant? <laughs> and I said, well, I'm a senior up in the hill up at Syracuse. I, he said, I, did, I, did I ask you that? Did you hear me ask you that? I said, no. He said, why do I care where you are, what you are? Maybe you're full of bullshit. I said, no, I'm, I'm actually not. He said, well, there's your office. Show up tomorrow, you're my assistant. Otherwise, I guess we'll know who's full of shit and who's not, won't we? And I walked out of that office. I took his photograph pointing at my new office, and I walked out, uh, and I thought, I think I've just been hired to work in an art museum. <laughs> I'm not sure, but uh, time will tell. And I show up the next morning, and sure enough, 
there he was. You know, uh, there was my job, and, and there was my first real mentor. And uh, this man, James Harris, is still very important in my life. Little did I know, he, he knew what video art was. Uh, he, because he'd been at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington before he came to this museum, and he was friends with a number of people, including this man whose photograph as a young man I have up here on the screen, a <coughs> Korean artist named Nam Joon Paik. And so, um, in the very, one of the very first exhibitions um, I worked on with Jim, not as a curator yet, because I was still just, you know, I was 20 years old. I mean, I'd never worked in an art museum. I barely took any art history courses. In fact, I slept through several art history courses because they were always a great way, place to catch up on your sleep. You know, nine o'clock class with the lights out. <clears throat> Perfect, but it wasn't really what I was interested in. So I knew nothing. I didn't know what Fluxus was. I didn't know who Joseph Boyce was. I surely didn't know who some Korean genius named Nam Joon Paik was. I did know who Yoko Ono was. And the first show that Jim had me work on with him was Yoko Ono's first major survey show called This Is Not Here. And, uh, and, um, and so my job in that show, um, as we started, as Jim was working with Yoko to organize the show, and we drove down to the city and to work with John and Yoko, uh, Jim said, your job is to take John, he knew I played guitar in a band, he said, and you played guitar with John somewhere in another room and let me work with Yoko. And I thought to myself, I'm being paid now $100 a week, this was my salary. I thought this was great, but I'm being paid $100 a week and my first job is to play guitar with John Lennon? Shit. <laughs> Why was I thinking about being a journalist? <laughs> I was all wrong. This is like the real stuff. And of course, it was the beginning of something that, I mean, I can joke about it, but, and of course that was true. I did get to spend several days locked in a, smoke-filled hotel suite with John Lennon playing Beatles songs and playing the Paul parts. And that was, that was, you know, a wonderful time. But what it really meant for me was the beginning of learning from artists, of, of learning about art from artists and of learning about the history of art. And the, more important than the history of art, the purpose of art from artists. And so during Yoko's show, her survey show, she, of course, invited uh, most of her Fluxus buddies to participate in the show, and one of the people she invited <laughs> to participate was Namjoon, uh, who uh, you know, I'd now heard of, <clears throat> and, uh, and I was anxious to meet, and uh, he became a, a true friend and great mentor to me as well. And um, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with Namjoon. Of course, Namjoon loved Iceland. I mean, you know, it was Nam Jun talking about Diderot and visiting him in Iceland, which was probably the first time that, you know, it occurred to me that there were artists in Iceland. I mean, I didn't, I never thought of the fact that, <clears throat> that there was this kind of conversation between Europe and the United States that actually passed through Iceland. <clears throat> but Nam Jun, and this is a, uh, uh, was the first person to kind of clue me into this, and in fact, to introduce me to, to Diderot. And here, We'll see if we can make this work. Is an early, oops, let's see if we, how do we, oops, I do not want to give you feedback. Here we go. <laughs> it's a 1967 uh, performance of, of Nam June's, just a, a simple performance. So, let's see. No. And Television is banal and video is boring. <laughs> I think we have to get rid of something behind here again. This should be more seamless, sorry, but it's not.
And so just out of respect for Namju, and I think of <clears throat> the topic tonight is Pike's Revenge, the success of the failure of video art. Because in many ways, <clears throat> what, what Namjoon was interested in <clears throat> uh, as a composer, as a pianist, <clears throat> as, a, a, as an intellectual, and as, a, as the father of video art, was not video per se. It was not video uh, for the sake of video in any formal way. It was video for what video or television represented, <clears throat> which was, in a way, and there's Pike later in life, uh, and it, what it represented for Pike <clears throat> was the ability of an artist uh, to take a, a, a more active role <clears throat> in the way the world really worked. If, if we think about uh, Pike's career, and, uh, and its trajectory as a, <clears throat> as a, as a artist who studied uh, composition and piano in Tokyo and then philosophy in, in Heidelberg, uh, and then fell into the circle of Karlheinz Stockhausen and through Stockhausen into the circle of John Cage and, and Merce Cunningham and, and the like, uh, we see that what, what, what Pike was interested in was the integration of art and life. And, Taking a cue from John Cage's notion of the, of the prepared piano, of the idea of, 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 of an instrument uh, <coughs> that would be transformed in a way that would produce unpredictable results that were often comic and, and strange, but more importantly, that would allow the composer to reach into the instrument to affect the instrument in ways that were unpredictable uh, was central to the way Pike thought. <coughs> And early on, he saw television as something that needed to be messed with and manipulated. Um, this, these are images from, from the very first exhibition of video as art, we might say, anywhere in the world. This was in 1963 in the gallery Parnassa in Wuppertal, Germany, where uh, Pike was working, Wuppertal, fairly close to Cologne, as some of you know, and he was working at, uh, near Cologne because Karlheinz Stockhausen was the composer in residence at WDR, the German television network. And so uh, Pike, uh, since he saw, uh, and as Pike would say, as he was a poor man from a poor country, electronic music was already taken, he would try to do electronic television because he wanted to go where no one else was. He, you know, he wanted to take the, <clears throat> not only the path less, less, less taken, but an empty road. And so, uh, Pike started messing with television images, and you can see here a distorted TV image. This was actually, uh, you know, an image of the installation of <clears throat> of that first video exhibition. Now, again, this is before Sony had invented or released the portable video camera. So the only way an artist could work in television then was to just take television sets, plug them in, and do things with them in the way that uh, that Cage perhaps had with with pianos. And Pike came up with this simple idea, which uh, was called Magnet TV. I think we have a, a better image of it here. This is a work we actually acquired for the Whitney when I was there. And quite simply, for those of you who are old enough to remember how television used to work before it was a digital flat screen, television actually was a, a really big, thick thing. Because in the back of the television was a, a essentially a, a, an electronic gun that shot <coughs> electrons at a phosphorescent coated screen, and that's how the video image was created. I see that there are people of more or less my age here, so I'm not speaking a, a, a totally foreign language, but I can tell you that in my last seminar of undergraduates, nobody had any idea how, that that was how television used to work, that, that there was this gun in the back. And I said, no, no, that's, it wasn't digital. Pre-digital? You mean before? Uh, yes, there was, a, there was a time before digital. So uh, that stream of electrons being a stream of electrons could be, uh, could be manipulated by a giant standing magnet like the one here. And so Pike would uh, just turn on the TV to generally to news, <clears throat> but anything. And then by just twisting the magnet, the, the, uh, re the, the stream of electrons would be, would be altered in, in weird ways unpredictable ways, ways that people hadn't seen before, and he thought that was kind of interesting, but more interesting than the actual image uh, was the implication of 
the ability to manipulate a television image, that an artist could reach into this machine, uh, which was more than just the machine. It was a machine that had to do with the formation of consciousness. You know, it was a machine that, as Pike knew, having studied uh, and read deeply in, in, in 20th century German literature and philosophy, uh, from the writings of Bertolt Brecht in 1929 in his theory of radio, <laughs> that there was a reason that radio and then television were developed commercially as one-way media. There was a reason. Uh, and Brecht was prescient enough to understand that re reason uh, well before Hitler made it necessary for every uh, family and every home in Nazi Germany to have a radio that had only one station and to have that radio on all the time. Uh, that's kind of an extreme example of, of the one notion of one-way media. Of, uh, uh, especially when, as Brecht pointed out in his essay, uh, that inherent in the medium was two-way capacity. There was no reason that radio had to be developed as a one-way uh, medium, except to commercially or politically or ideologically control an audience. And Pike understood that. And so from the very beginning, Pike's interest in television and in video was about combating the idea of being a passive receiver being passive in general, of the, the idea that television was <clears throat> a one-way medium that was part of a whole system, uh, a, a whole system of, of interlocking structures that enabled governments on a wide range of ideological, a wide ranging ideological spectrum to control the ways in which um, their, that population would behave, ranging from the most extreme, as in Nazi Germany, to the most apparently benign, like uh, in the United States that I grew up in. As my friend Bill Viola said, uh, we grew up having a, a seven-channel childhood, which, you know, again, sounded quaint to my students today. I mean, there were only seven channels, and someone said, yeah, but you know, there are hundreds of channels now. I said, yeah, but there were seven, and we actually were laboring under the illusion that there was an actual difference, so there were seven choices. What we didn't realize that it was seven of the same with just slightly different food colorings added <clears throat> to, each, to each of the channels. And that, uh, and that our consciousness, and, and speaking from a very sad life of experience, uh, our consciousness was fully molded by this instrument. And the consciousness of my generation, I think, was also fully molded by this, by this instrument. Uh, in, yes, a more benign way, but molded is molded. And, and the way we thought, the things we were interested in, our desire to become consumers, our, our interest in, in all sorts of aspects of, <clears throat> of the world, were formed by this, <coughs> by, this, by this medium. And it wasn't until uh, our uh, you know, late adolescence and the, and the need to uh, uh, find ourselves an oppositional generation because of the war in Vietnam, because of our interest in the civil rights movement, because of things that seemed to take us and push us away from the, the accepted, from what was being told to us on the seven o'clock news every night, as Walter Cronkite would say, that's the way it is. He would end every news broadcast on, you know, the most uh, respected uh, newsman of a generation, and he would end every newscast by literally telling us, that's the way it is. You're like, don't mess around here. We're, I'm telling you exactly what's happening. And we all believe, you know, oh, that's the way it is. You know, in fact, it wasn't until Cronkite turned against the war in, in Vietnam that many people who were far less politically uh, inclined to oppose that war began to say, oh, if he's opposed to it, maybe that's the way it is also. You know, so that control could work both ways. It surely worked both ways against Richard Nixon at, at that point. So Pike, beginning in this point here, in this very simple thing, was really pointing in a way that I don't think many other observers of this work, and of course nobody wrote about it in 1963 and 64. You can be sure that no German art critic ever said, hmm, the implication of this work here is, you know, it was a long time coming before that happened. But Pike, I believe, intuitively understood that. Uh, here's, uh, here's Pike with an image of Richard Nixon that he manipulated with that same device. And it's actually kind of a wonderful twisted image of twisted, tricky dick. Uh, but, but Pike also had a great sense of humor, was also a great humanitarian, and, and also very humble. Uh, you know, he, he, 
you know, he was one of the few geniuses I've ever met, I have to say. Uh, and if you found yourself in his circle, as I was fortunate enough to, you would often be woken in the middle of the night because he had the strange habit that some people have of sleeping only three hours at a time and then being up for some odd number of hours and then sleeping again. So if you were a young person in his circle, you could be count on being woken up by the telephone ringing at two or three or four in the morning every once in a while. And this is before there were answering machines. So your phone just kept ringing until you picked it up. And I, I, in fact, I remember in 1973, 1974, being called by him one night. And uh, the woman I was then living with said, oh, that must be your friend. Why don't you answer it? And I said, oh, God. You know, like, pick up the phone. And Pike was always so wonderfully thoughtful about waking you up in the middle of the night. He was silent when you'd pick up the phone. So you'd pick up the phone, there'd be nothing there. And then after about 30 seconds, you hear him go like, heh, heh, heh. <laughs> <laughs> and you say, oh, Nandrew, and you know, I figured it was, you know, what, what's, what's happening? He'd say, oh, boy genius, I, uh, boy genius, I need to talk to you, boy genius. Everybody was boy genius, right? Of course, for a long time, I thought, who thinks I'm a genius? <laughs> And it was years before I met everyone. He always called me that, too. And, oh, okay, well, whatever. But it was a nice way of waking someone up by calling them a genius. And he said, boy, genius. I, uh, he said, uh, and it took me years to understand what he was saying. Of course, he spoke nine languages. But when he spoke to you in English, you thought he was, like, you know, like just learning English that day. And he'd say, um, you know, uh, information flow is so enormous, so big. It's people, it's like an ocean and people in a boat in the ocean and no idea where the, where the edge of the ocean is. And I say, yeah, okay, thanks, good night. <laughs> uh, <all> right. <laughs> I had no idea he had just invented fucking Google, right? <laughs> like if I just thought, hmm, ocean, we need to know information, start a company, let's do this, right? I mean, you know, it, you know, the joke that Al Gore claimed to invent uh, the internet, you know, that's a joke. But the reality is that the first person who actually wrote about the internet in, in any real way was Pike in an essay he wrote for the Rockefeller Foundation in 1972, uh, Education in the Paperless Society was called, and he, he talked about this electronic highway. And so it was this idea of the highway that he realized was wrong. That's what he was calling me to say. It wasn't a highway. It wasn't a highway. Highway, you know where to go. You just stay on the highway. It's, it's not a highway, it's an ocean. It's like, oh. I think it took me literally 30 years before I caught up with what he meant by that idea, which was, you know, amazing. I mean, everybody should be as lucky to have a, a mentor like Pike. But, you know, Pike also had this great sense of humor uh, and wonderful idea. This was a piece where he just uh, broke the television so that it just made a in just one line and turned it on inside and he called this piece Zen for TV, which I always thought was quite, quite wonderful. Uh, and then this work here, which is not a very good image of, um, and imagine we haven't talked about video art yet. We haven't talked about video tape because it still didn't exist. But this is a piece called uh, Participation Television. And again, extremely important. Even though it was, you know, like right now, this Mac makes more interesting images than Pike could make. Right then, if I just leave this go, you know, every once in a while, then the Mac goes, so I start making these kind of lovely little uh, color, colorful images that jump all over the screen. <clears throat> That's basically what Pike was doing here. But in order to make the image happen, you had to speak into a microphone. And he figured out a way of changing that sound into some electrical impulse that created some colorful image on a television set, on a color TV. Again, not very interesting as art on a formal level, but as an idea. Again, here are people literally talking to their television, literally taking a role in, in, uh, in creating a relationship here. And so, without being too overt about it, Pike continued to create what he called participation TV, to, to, to create television that, that under, uh, <laughs> underscored the notion that television had to change from a one-way medium into some other form of communication for it to in, in any way be a medium that could be healthy. Uh, 
But meanwhile, at this point in time, you know, and, and this, he did a series of video Buddhas, which I thought were always great. This was actually cheating because it's the Buddha looking at, his, at one candle. But he, he made many images, many var versions of this work where a variety of Buddhas would be looking at their own image in an endless closed loop. That was great. This is work that, <laughs> that we showed at the Everson Museum in, in 1972 on this kind of really futuristic round television set we all thought was so cool. <laughs> but when, when Paik uh, started to create videotapes, and he did uh, create videotapes, he did them in a way to create what he considered uh, would be a kind of a variety show uh, for, a new, for a new era. You know, what would it mean if you had global television instead of television being a national or a local thing? What would it mean if you actually had, if, if, if that, that instrument was global? Well, it's kind of an interesting idea. And he created this piece called Global Groove, uh, which he then uh, installed in a variety of ways. This is uh, the last time he installed it at the Guggenheim in a piece uh, that he called a TV Garden. And so the, this show, uh, Global Groove, which he produced at the television workshop, he produced um, after a long, he had already been involved in an interesting series of inventions, uh, developing what he called a video synthesizer with his friend, the Japanese engineer, Shuya Abe, uh, that would allow him again to manipulate more, more, more directly and more in a more interesting way, in a more kind of psychedelic way, uh, video imagery. Um, because again, he said, you know, he had to do things that were interesting. He was a poor man from a poor country. He had to do, he said, television is so interesting that I have to do something even more interesting. I, I knew he was only kidding, but the reality was he also was uh, being honest. He knew that he had to do things in a way that took it out of the kind of world of just conceptual artists and conceptual art. <clears throat> and that little closed circle of, of his Fluxus friends and the people who thought that performance art and video seen in, in lofts by 20 people at a time would, was interesting. His idea of, for video was that it had to break through to a broader public. And so he created this, this one work and several uh, afterwards uh, in the same format that were sort of like a gro global version of a variety show. Uh, and, uh, Let's see if we can get this to work again. Oh, come on, allow me in. Okay. Go back and start over. This is a glimpse of a video landscape of tomorrow, when you will be able to switch to any TV station on the earth, and TV guides will be as fat as the Manhattan Telephone Book. completely lame. You know, like, there was nothing hip about it. He, he found the corniest dancers from some Broadway musical and had them dancing to a really bad version of Mitch Ryder and the Detroit Wheel. 